We're happy to have Dr. Mark Yarborough as our chapel speaker today. Since July 2020, he has served as the sixth president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he also serves as professor of Bible exposition. Dr. Yarborough's twin passions for the local church and also for theological education have worked in tandem for over 30 years. Along with his responsibilities as president here, he serves as an elder at Centerpoint Church in Mesquite, and he enjoys leading tours and speaking at conferences. He has been married to Jennifer, his high school sweetheart, for 30 years, and they have four adult children and a son-in-law and reside in Sunnyvale, Texas. Won't you join me in welcoming our president to our chapel today? Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. I love summer chapel. It's like a summer devotion. That's really what it is just for a few minutes here today. Well, I had a morning not long ago, like many of you have had before. It had been a busy night. I was running late. Things weren't going quite my way. My clothes weren't like I wanted them to be. It was a bad hair day, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was loaded up, had more to, you know, get out the door. And I made it all. I threw it all in the back seat. I was already looking at traffic. I knew I was going to be late to my appointment here on campus. I hopped in my car. Everybody else was already gone. I threw the key in and I went like this, click. You're not expressing the emotion that I thought you would do that. <laughs> click. You know, if you've ever, thank you very much, if you have ever owned a car or you have participated in the automobile industry and you have a car and you've been there before, sometimes you just turn it and it goes click. And you know exactly what that means. You hear a very distinct sound. It's click or click, click, click. Well, I looked in the back seat and I realized that we had left some little small lights on. And so through the evening, it had drained the battery to where there was really nothing left in the battery. The battery wasn't ruined. It was going to be able to hold a charge, but at that moment, it was simply depleted. Anybody ever been there? Shake your head, yes. Click. Thank you very much. I got to thinking about that moment, and there are moments in our lives where that's kind of the picture of our spiritual life. Click. It's not ruined. It's just depleted. Now, I say that at this time of the year because here we are, and I realize that as a campus community for students, for faculty, for any variety of reasons, that kind of click occurs in our lives. Sometimes it happens after traumatic moments, doesn't it, where we're just depleted. There's really nothing left, it seems, in the battery it happens after a long grind, I think, of our campus as it relates to those of you who faithfully have been working on a particular project called Titan, where it can just deplete the life out of you, and it impacts even our spiritual walk, doesn't it? Trust me, for students, it can happen after the end of a semester. You're just tired. The grind has taken a toll, and certainly, I promise you this, I say this to my fellow faculty members that are here, it happens to us. I mean, we make it through a big, giant weekend last weekend, and I've had board meetings and graduation, and when I went home on Saturday night, friends, I turned into a puddle. I was tired. Click. Well, if you happen to find yourself there today, I just, as a few minutes here, just a real quick devotion. We've actually already been singing about it from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you find yourself with a depleted battery in your spiritual life, Paul gives us some reminders actually of things to do. You've heard this before. You've read it before, but I want to remind us right now Right here, when we're starting into some summer months, if you find yourself with a spiritually depleted battery, Paul says these words in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says this, "'Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship.'" Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, His pleasing, 
and his perfect will. Two familiar verses, three particular challenges for us, especially if you find yourself with a depleted spiritual battery. Number one is this. We are called to remember God's mercy. Look at how he starts off in the text. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Now, if I was teaching a book on Romans right now, I would open up and say, oh my, look at what he's already talked about in Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. You see how it starts off here, right, with the opening word, therefore, it's connecting us to a big, giant, massive context. And the dominant message of that is about the mercy of God. In other words, he has established over and over and over again, Paul has, of saying, mercy has been extended because do you know what should have been ours? Condemnation. Paul builds this huge argument, by the way, those of you that know that book so well, when you get to Romans chapter 8, what does he say? He says, therefore, there is now no what? Condemnation. Because of who? Christ Jesus and what he has done. Paul builds this massive argument, and he says, therefore, I urge you, in some of our English translations, right, I beseech you, I encourage you, brothers and sisters to remember God's mercy. Friends, if you find yourself in a depleted moment, and you know when that is in our life, and it just goes click, and it's not what it should be, start by remembering God's mercy. You know, we have been saved from something, correct? Anybody amen with me on that? It's good for us to remember that over and over again. Mark Yarbrough came to faith. As a kid, and I can remember listening to my dad preach a sermon on hell, and I thought, man, I need some fire insurance. I want none of that. I said, sign me up. It was a simple faith. And I said, if Jesus has made a way, and I don't have to receive condemnation because what he has done, I'm in. But you know what's amazing? While that is certainly true, the more I grow in my walk and you do the same, we're not just saved from something, but we're saved for something, aren't we? And so the text, notice what Paul says here. So number one is if you find yourself in a depleted battery in your spiritual walk, remember God's mercy. But the second thing makes sense. We need to reunite in worship. We need to reunite and worship. Get back in the text. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, here's what he says, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Paul uses all these great Old Testament pictures for us of the sacrificial system. You step all the way back in the Old Testament, and we understand the pictures of a sacrifice being killed and laid upon the altar. Paul uses this great picture for us of present your bodies in view of what God's done. He says the only result is for us to give our lives to Him. And he says that actually is your spiritual act of worship. Look at the picture. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, who we are and how we carry out our lives. If you find yourself in a moment of depletion, start by remembering the mercies of God, but continue on by saying, okay, Lord, I'm tired, but I give myself to you. As one old scholar said, the problem with the living sacrifice, you've heard this before, is that it has a tendency to continually crawl off the altar. And that is true. And we find that if it impacts you and me when we find our moments where we go click, say, Lord, all I can do is give you who I am. Everything that I have is yours. In view of what you have done for me, you have called me, you have saved me from something, but you have called me for something. 
If you haven't done that in a long time, to go back and reflect upon again the mercies of God and to say, but God, you have called me to present to you my very being as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Friends, that is what our spiritual act of worship is called to do. Well, look what else the text says here. Verse 2 says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to remember God's mercy. We need to reunite in worship. But if we want to stay there, friends, we need to renew our minds. I am not sure in today's day and age that there has ever been a greater battle, I think, that the evil one assaults upon believers. See, if you really think about it, right, we're all under the curse from Genesis chapter 3. I'm actually not sure that in regard to Satan's domain over our lives as believers because we're already headed to the grave. Anybody agree with me on that? In case you haven't realized it, I say it just to, as a point of clarity. You're all dying. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, where there is sin, there is death. So actually, I'm not sure that's the greatest battle that Satan has in front of him in tack on believers. We know that our souls are secure because of who Jesus is and what he's done. So Satan knows that he can't, in terms of believers, go after that. But I think the greatest assault is on our minds. And Paul uses this phrase here of saying, renew your mind. If you want to stay in that position of a strong spiritual battle, remember the mercies of God, reunite in worship, continually present ourselves to the living God as a living sacrifice. But to stay there, friends, we must renew our minds. I can remember the very first computer programming class that I ever took at the University of North Texas. And those of you are saying, Mark Yarbrough, you actually took a computer programming class. I did, and I realized that that was not my calling from God. (laughs) I walked into that class. It was a brilliant programmer. Apparently, he'd written all these articles and had done all this programming. And we were all ready to take these incredible notes about how to be computer programmers, and I sat there, and he walked up on stage, and this is what he said. He said, trash in, trash out. What comes in will go out. And he walked off the stage. And all these years later, I can remember his lecture. (laughs) Hey, friends, you know what happens to us as believers? Trash in, trash out. What comes in? will go out. Paul, I think, knows exactly what he's doing, being led by the Holy Spirit. He says, hey, renew your minds. Spend time in God's Word. If you find yourself in that moment of depletion right here as we transition into summer, for whatever the reason, whatever the cause, let God's Word do what God's Word can do as it pours over us. Be very careful, friends, what you watch what you listen to. It chips away at our souls. It chips away at our values. It is Satan's greatest assault upon believers today. Friends, renew your minds. So, as we start summer together, if you find yourself in that spiritual moment of click, and you need... God's spiritual jumper cables to reignite us afresh, anew. Remember His mercies. Reunite in worship and renew your mind. It'll give us all the juice that we need to keep moving forward by God's grace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. For your word, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are right here in this room. Lord, I specifically pray for those that are tired, that know that picture that I'm describing. Even in our spiritual walk, we can find ourselves depleted. May we constantly go back to what you have reminded us to do. May we revel in your mercies. May we present ourselves anew and afresh to you. 
Help us, Lord, to renew our minds daily so that we stay in your presence, reminded of who you are and what you long for us as your children. Lord, we present our lives to you. Take them as an offering. We pray these things in Jesus' name.